We are recording. Hello, everyone. I'm Cynthia Curry, Project Director of the National AIM Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our open house. We're so excited to share our new home with you. So please grab a refreshment, begin introducing yourselves. In the chat panel, be sure to select all panelists and attendees from the drop down above the text entry field. Also note that our home is equipped with live captioning. To view the caption, select the closed caption button on your Zoom menu bar. Thank you to our live captioner, Beth, for her service today from ACS. And if you haven't already, please go ahead and pick up the materials for today's webinar. Uh, you will find those on the event page uh, for this webinar. And the recording of the webinar will also be available uh, from that same page within the coming week. Like any successful open house, we have a fantastic lineup of hosts. Uh, each is going to share with you their favorite feature or resource of our new website. As I mentioned earlier, I'm Cynthia Curry. Our other hosts will introduce themselves in turn, and that's Cassie Sell, Janet Peters, Louise Perez, Maggie Pickett, and as always, Leslie O'Callaghan is monitoring the chat. And I'm sorry to report uh, that Joy, Joy Zabala, isn't feeling well today. I know many of you were looking forward to seeing her. Uh, we send her, her our best wishes uh, to feel better soon. So before we enter our new home, I wanted to recognize that many of you have been longtime users of the AIM Center's former website. And we know this has been a transition to a new design, but we've been delighted by the positive response uh, to that design uh, since its launch in March. The changes are somewhat subtle on the surface, so we're really excited to show you around and point out some of the updates that may not be readily apparent. So let's begin by following Cassie to our homepage. Cassie? Hi, um, I'm Cassandra Sell. I'm art director at CAST. I've been with CAST for almost six years, and I wear a lot of design hats, everything from user experience design to interface design to branding. So um, it was really exciting to take part in this. I'm going to show you my favorite part of the website, uh, the homepage. And the homepage is usually something that comes together last if you're um, you know, engaging in kind of good content strategy um, processes. So it was really kind of a shining moment to see everything come together in this space uh, from the navigation to just the components playing nicely within the page. Um, you can see all of the, um, the different block styles that we have available to us being able to really support a staple of content as well as all of the new and engaging content that the AIM Center puts out, being able to give people a nice entry into the space. So the balance of information, um, new resources, uh, upcoming, upcoming events, uh, just getting to know the center, all of that's at play in the homepage. And as you dig down into the details, you might notice that the palette has been updated and refreshed to support a kind of expansion of functionality, including our focus and hover states. So making sure that we've got an eye, not just for our palette representing the brand that it always has been, but making sure that it supports a more usable experience. Um, you can also see a font update. Uh, when it comes to picking fonts, there's a lot of things at play, but one of the things, uh, details I'll point you to is just the AIM Center has a lot of acronyms that we use, just representing different partners and concepts just around the web website. And you can see right there, one of my favorite details of this font is that it has a serif eye, even though it's a sans serif font, which is optimal for mobile, you know, all kinds of viewing on the website we can still very clearly tell when it's not a lowercase L. <laughs> um, so it's just the, the font is Noto Sans and it's just full of details like that, including a variety of weights. Um, so I'm really happy to see how it's performing on the website with all of our content. Um, and I think that's it for my favorite part of the website. <laughs> all right, thank you, Cassie. And we give Cassie a ton of credit for her design chops. Um, as Cassie mentioned, she's the art director um, for, for CAST and really has uh, been the beacon uh, for all of these subtle um, changes that we love about the website because it just is usable, it's beautiful uh, without really trying very hard, it's just elegant. So thank you for that, uh, Cassie. Thank you. Next, we're going to go to Janet, who's going to uh, show us her favorite, one of her favorite parts of the website, and that's the what's your role page. 
Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. And I'm so excited about the new AIM website. Um, I have found that I am personally using it to answer TA questions and to do my own research. So I hope that you all find it um, as useful as I do. So one of my, um, so I'm Janet Peters. I've been with CAST two years. I'm a senior technical um, assistance specialist and I work mostly on the sites project, um, but I do work on AIM for some of it too. So uh, the, my favorite part is really, if you go to get started, and what's your role? And what I love about that section is that it is just the you know highest level if you are new or you're taking the cliff notes version of what, <laughs> what you need to know from your perspective. And I think that this um, was, all of this information was in the old website, but right now it's just, um, contained in this section and easy to find, and it gives you not too much information, but just enough to get started if you are coming as like a pre-service teacher or a family member. And so I think that this is one of my favorite um, places to go because it just is the top level, what you need to know to get you started. There's a lot more information and we're going to talk about it today. Um, but this is if you're new or just need a refresher or just really want the the pistachio meat of the of the site, I think this is a great place to go. So the sections are, and I see Cynthia's driving the ship, are um, if you're a caregiver or a family member, if you work in K-12 education, um, and if you scroll, keep scrolling, <laughs> if you work in early uh, learning contexts or settings higher education, pre-service teacher educator, workforce development, if you are the person who purchases or decides if something's accessible and does that vetting, or if you're a publisher or developer, just go here and find the information that's, that's designed for you. So this is my um, favorite, or at least my favorite place to start. So you might dig deeper, but it's a great place to start. Great, thanks, Janet. And um, the way Janet did point out that this information was on the previous website. You may remember it as the quick starts and the quick starts really was a, a, a Q and A. We streamlined uh, the, those quick starts into this what's your role section. Uh, so we really tried to be a little bit more targeted and to contextualize all the resources on our site. So you'll see that as Janet mentioned, we have all of these different roles and the resources are really the same in some cases for each role, but we really tried to contextualize the why behind why a particular uh, person with a responsibility for providing AIM would want to find that information on our site. Luis, we're gonna go to you. What are you going to show us? Hello everyone, I'm Luis Perez. I'm a technical assistant specialist at CAS and I spend most of my time on the National AIM Center. So I am going to go over to the Use tab, and then we're going to bring up the Personalizing the Reading Experience page. And this is a great example of how we streamlined content on the website. Uh, this used to be three pages, and we've condensed it into one page. And as Cynthia scrolls down, you'll notice that we focus on those features that are common across a number of different platforms first to give you a sense of all of the options that are available to personalize the reading experience for learners. But then as she continues scrolling down, you'll see that there's more applications. So how to use the different read aloud features. And then we conclude with a try it yourself section of that page. So this is where you get to try out some of these features on your preferred platform. And our hope is to create a more active learning experience. So you learn about the features and then you get to explore them on your preferred platform using uh, this section for guidance. So that's uh, one of the pages. There's a page for writing as well uh, that follows a similar pattern. And what makes this personalization of the reading and writing experience is we need to have content that's accessible. And so we have a couple of resources to help with that. So if you go to the Create tab, Cynthia, some of you are probably familiar with this resource, Designing for Accessibility with Poor. Uh, this provides lots of guidance on how to implement accessibility best practices by following the four 
core principles that are foundational to the web content accessibility guidelines. And again, we've given it a refresh by taking another look at the icons. We love those icons. We're always sharing those in our presentations. Um, they do a great job of illustrating each uh, core principle. And uh, as Cynthia selected that icon, you'll notice that we have long description and it opens up the image so that it's a lot bigger, a lot easier to uh, perceive and understand. And again, you have that long description as well to follow along. Now, you may not always be creating content. Sometimes you're selecting or procuring content, and that's ideal because when you procure accessible content, then you have an even greater impact. So under our acquire section, we have vetting for accessibility. And this is another resource that, again, is grounded in those poor principles of the web content accessibility guidelines. And it provides you with a set of questions for each principle that you can ask when evaluating a resource for adoption or procurement. So those poor principles uh, really provide a memorable mnemonic that we can use to remember those accessibility best practices. And then the graphics, the icons really provide a nice element that really allow you to uh, follow those principles a lot easier throughout the website. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Cynthia. Great, thanks, Luis. And what I'm going to uh, to show you, one of my favorite features, is really a complement to what Luis was showing you. So what Luis was demonstrating was the resources on our website that really pertain to large scale procurement, selecting materials and technologies that are going to be accessible for all students. They're going to be flexible. Uh, as Louise pointed out, we really are focusing on perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust, which we believe can be the foundation for the selection, the procurement, the creation of all materials uh, and technologies that are provided to students. But we also know, and this is legacy uh, resource from the, from the AIM Center, that there will be times that students will need an alternative equivalent to, uh, to the material. So what were once known as specialized formats, which are now called accessible formats, there needs to be a decision-making process to determine who needs those. So on our new website, you'll find that information by going to the Acquire tab, because really what we're thinking about uh, by the, through navigating through our website is that if somebody needs accessible formats for a student, they're thinking about how do I get that braille format? How do I get the digital text? How do I get the audio format? So the entryway to the decision-making process is to go to the acquire section and selecting acquiring accessible formats. So this is the entry point uh, to, the, uh, to the, the, whole, the, pro the process by going over here to learn more about decision-making and accessible formats. The acquiring accessible formats is actually one of those steps of decision making. Uh, it walks you through the specific sources of accessible formats, Bookshare Learning Ally, and the Louis Plus database are some of the, uh, the most basic and the most uh, reliable. Uh, of course, the AMPs that are in your state, we point you to resources to learn more and to contact the AMPs, the accessible media producers in your state. Accessible formats from publishers. So this information really digs down into NIMIS and the NIMAC, um, and then of course, um, local conversion. So what do teachers, special educators, uh, paraprofessionals, anybody who needs to do those conversions on the fly, what do they need to know? So we really streamlined from the previous website, all that information about sources of accessible formats into one page. But then we also provide an opportunity to dig a little bit deeper by going to the decision-making and accessible format section so this walks you through those three, the three processes of determining a learner's need, selecting the accessible format or multiple formats that a learner may need, and then acquiring those accessible formats, which really takes you back to that, uh, that previous page. Now, many of you will be really excited to know that the AIM Navigator is back and it's not the online version. Um, we, Joy Zabala and I did a decision-making and accessible formats webinar a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I was in, the, in an enviable position to announce that we are not returning, able to return to the online version of the Navigator, um, but we do have the, the downloadable version. So the 
the AIM navigator that you download goes a little bit deeper into that decision-making process, has a series of FAQs that really supplements the information that's on our website. And then the other thing I wanted to point out when it comes to this area of providing accessible formats for students who need them is that the NIMAS and NIMAC content on our website now has its own section. So whereas in our previous website, information about NIMAS and the NIMAC, the National Instructional Materials Accessibility Standard and the National Instructional Materials Access Center really had various places across the site. It's kind of distributed, which made sense, uh, but it, we thought that maybe it made more sense for our redesign to put the NIMAS and the NIMAC in its own home on our website. And not only that, but really the NIMAS and NIMAC have has two different audiences. What is it that users of the NIMAC need to know in terms of uh, SEAs and LEAs? And then what is it that producers, that publishers need to know? So we separated those into two sections, which offers another branch um, on our site. So we're going to conclude with Maggie, who is going to bring us back outward to a bigger picture of providing AIM. Maggie? Absolutely, thanks, Cynthia. Um, so everybody shared really amazing resources and content that's located here in our home. Um, I don't know, I, I noticed in the chat, you all have um, experiences kind of similar to what I have. You, uh, many of you are coordinating um, systems of the provision of AIM. Um, in my previous role, I'm somewhat new to the AIM Center at CAST here, um, but in my previous role, I, I coordinated these systems, supported coordinating these systems at a state and local level. Um, and one of the things that was really helpful when doing that work um, was to uh, the quality indicators. Um, these quality indicators on this website have really taken on this beautiful life of their own. Um, so as, as, as we kind of walk through the page here, you can see all the cogs and, and all the graphics. Um, and it, it just outlines the quality indicators in a way that's really um, nice and kind of helps provide a summary. Um, so looking at this, I wanna bookmark this and go to this every time I'm having conversations around um, our system and thinking about um, all of these different components. Um, the other thing that's really great about this website is that we at the AIM Center are starting to kind of branch and widen the scope around the provision of AIM. So again, those of you who are here today, many of you have, have been with us before, you know about the quality indicators for AIM for the K-12 system. You'll notice that um, the uh, coordinating an early childhood pro system for providing AIM, higher education and workforce development have all, um, we've developed um, critical components in each of these areas so that we're expanding that, um, the scope of the provision of these, these uh, resources for students. So it's really a great place to kind of branch off. So, so it gives you a nice visual with the wonderful graphics, offers summaries as we're having those conversations, but then you get to the bottom of the page and you can start to dive into each one of these areas and what are the specifics and those critical components. Um, as Cynthia is showing us going into coordinating system, you can read the critical components within that blue box. There's also a nice summary there, but then it also gets into what are the, what are the legal components and policies um, and other components of guidance around the provision of AIM for this population. So, so we see some familiar ones here, but if we were to go over to the early childhood or go over into higher ed and workforce development, we're gonna see different components to each one of those sections um, as far as the uh, relevant laws and policies. You can also, Cynthia is demonstrating that each one of these components not only can be navigated to from that quality indicators page, but it can also be navigated to from that upper drop down menu under coordinate. So everything's just nestled right underneath and really um, multiple ways to get around and navigate the site. So this, from my perspective, working to coordinate a system is a really, really great way um, to kind of think about, about how to structure our system and get into the components. Um, and again, there's, there's the, um, uh, the, the resource. So uh, I think that's all I wanted to share about the quality indicators. I'm going to toss it back over to Cynthia to take us into the next um, activity that we have planned for today. Thank you, Maggie. Um, and for those of you who 
are for whom these other areas may be new early childhood higher education uh, workforce of course the aim center has its origins in k-12 and for the past six or seven years been doing more and more in the areas of those transition bridges of in and out of k-12 so we are as maggie said very proud of the of the quality indicators that we've developed for early childhood higher ed and workforce development and for each of those those bridge areas, those transition areas of early childhood, higher ed and workforce. In addition to the quality indicators, you will also find a, a knowledge development synthesis that really kind of makes transparent how we develop those quality indicators for those three other areas. Uh, we have deep history in supporting K-12 leadership at the state and local level. And we spent a lot of time in the, over the past three to four years investigating these other areas, what are this, what's a higher ed, higher ed setting like, early childhood context, workforce, what are the relevant laws, what does the provision of accessible materials and technologies look like in those environments. So for each of those, you'll see that we have a knowledge development synthesis that really covers all of the, the literature reviews, the interviews and focus groups that we conducted uh, last year in the year 2019 and, and 2020 um, in order to make sure that these quality indicators for these bridge areas really are as high quality, relevant and useful as we can make them. And of course, we are, we are iterating, we're improving them over time. We are, uh, all of these quality indicators, we're in the process of implementing through our AIM cohort, uh, which I'll just point out over here under the About Us, you'll see that our national AIM cohort now has uh, seven new states. Uh, the previous AIM center, we had eight states, so we're building on that. And these states are implementing both the K-12 quality indicators and those bridge areas, we call them our interagency collaboratives of early childhood, higher ed and workforce development. So these states are iterating with us, helping us uh, determine what works and what doesn't work with the quality indicators, how we can improve them over time. You'll also see under, um, under the, um, the coordinate section, you'll find the AIM pilot, um, and that is the tool that our stakeholders are using and it's free and open uh, for anybody who wants to learn more about the quality indicators, conduct needs assessment and progress monitoring uh, over time. I'm gonna jump back over to the slide deck and we're gonna take, take some time here to look at Sorry, I am, there we go. Um, to look at some questions, give you an opportunity to delve into these quality indicators. And I'm having difficulty expanding, uh, going into presentation mode. So I'm just going to leave it here for now because we will um, be giving you an opportunity uh, to go out, um, find our website, aem.cast.org, and I'm guessing many of you have been exploring along with us. And we'll give you about 15 to 20 minutes just to explore. We have some prompts here for you to, to consider as you, as you go through the site. For example, can you identify a resource of interest to you? How will you use that to teach others? We really like to promote our site as a resource, training, professional development, a treasure trove for those who are teaching others about accessible materials and technologies. Everything on our site is Creative Commons, so please take it. You can you you can make it your own. Uh, you can reuse it. Uh, you can uh, iterate yourself as you are, in, are as you're using our resources in your own settings. And then here are some questions uh, that you might use as as a guide. Once I have accessible educational materials, how do I how do I use those effectively? We have resources to support that. See if you can find those. How do I make content accessible for my classroom? Uh, and we know we use the word classroom uh, very generically now. We know that there's a lot of remote learning happening and we know that making materials accessible for students really does support remote learning. I think we learned from the pandemic how when students with disabilities who need accessible materials are away from those professionals who on the fly will convert them, that will transform them, that will troubleshoot accessible materials um, and challenges. When they're away from those professionals and at home, they're without access. So if the better we make decisions to provide accessible materials and technologies 
the more independent, the more progress, uh, and the better able to participate students who need AIM will be. So how can you make that content accessible regardless of the learning environment? Uh, what are some sources of accessible materials? And then what does a high quality system for accessible materials look like? So a lot of these questions we guided you to uh, during today's tour, but we encourage you to look for some other examples of resources uh, that you might implement that answer some of these questions. So we're going to give you about 15 minutes to do that. Please go ahead and be entering um, your questions and comments in the chat. And we really are going to give you an opportunity to explore.
Okay, some comments have been coming in the chat. Um, we're still here. <laughs> really wanted to give everybody an opportunity to uh, to make your own way, take a pathway through the through the website. One of the things that we would love to have feedback on in addition to the resources is how intuitive is your pathway through the site? If you are here today and you went if, with the intent of finding a resource on our website, how easily did you find it? If you weren't sure what you were looking for and just entered the site, how was your experience of discoverability? Uh, so let's take a look at some of the comments that have um, that have come in. Um, and I welcome my um, my co-hosts of the open house to uh, you know to pick up some of these some of these comments as as well. Uh, Betsy Dal Dalton is saying she loves the no mouse challenge. Uh, Betsy, where did you find that? Where did you where did you find the no mouse challenge? And I'm going to open it up to some of my other co-hosts to make their way through some of these comments that are are that are coming in, share their, their expertise and thoughts about them. I will chime in, this is Luis. I see a comment from Kathleen uh, that some of the links in the getting started with document accessibility resource are not working. So we'll look into that. We've uh, taken a look at those links a couple of times. It may be where we're posting them that's stripping the links out. So we're gonna move it and fix that, uh, that link for you so that they actually work. Uh, but those those links are available in our um, designing for accessibility with poor section as well. A lot of that same content. Elizabeth, I love your comment. How clear this work links to UDL and and the guidelines. Absolutely, it is the UDL framework is evident throughout the entire website, and and it's it's um it's it's really great to see from our perspective. This is Cassie. I just want to chime in and say how much I appreciate hearing how all these comments around this sort of ease of finding information. There was a lot of um, people might not notice that there's some size tweaking in the size of headings versus the size of the paragraph font. And there was, um, you know, just a little a little bit of math going into supporting an easier scanning experience. So if you're in a page that used to be um, you know, a lot of kind of feeling like fine print or there, you know, our headings get deep sometimes because we we really do dig into concepts as we go through pages. Um, I'm glad that this is feeling um, like an easy scan for people that things are feeling really findable. Yeah, this is Cynthia. I just wanted to, um, on Linda Wilson's comment, what does a high quality system for AIM look like? vendors and school systems on the same page about what students need. And I just wanted to point out Linda's comment uh, because one of the things that we that we didn't point out that I think um, you know Linda Wilson from Montgomery County Public Schools is using uh, around building a, a coordinated system there through a new mandated uh, compli or compliance uh, modules that uh, Linda is, is supporting. I just happen to know this about Linda. I wanted to put some of this uh, sort of in a, in a relevant context for everybody, but Linda has picked up on our under Get Started. You will see our uh, AIM Center featured resources, and one of our more recent updates to the site is this uh, online learning series under Build Your Accessibility Skills. And there, there's a five module series here of uh, self-paced, self-directed. Uh, modules that are, are in three parts. They are, you know, they, each section, a set of skills builds on each other. We do not provide any live uh, teaching or instruction on these, uh, but they are here again for you all to pick up and use in your own settings and to use them with people that you know need to, to do better um, or yourselves to do better around understanding accessibility, applying certain skills. 
And these are also have been pre-approved by a IAAP, the International Association of Accessibility Professionals uh, for continuing accessibility education credit. So um, if you do have IAAP credential or if you are interested in pursuing that, know that these modules um, are pre-approved for IAAP credit. There was, uh, this is Janet, and there was a comment on um, not seeing as much UDL. Um, and so just know that that was, if you're not seeing it, that was uh, not intentional. We really didn't remove any of the UDL language or the UDL resources. Some things are um, publications that are universal design for learning and may be available on the CAST main website. So also be sure to go to the CAST main site and search because we have lots of UDL, but it is still incorporated within the AIM site too. So if you're not seeing it, it might be a publication and available on the main CAST uh, website. And this is Luis also on the Get Started. There's an access to learning uh, page that also makes that connection between accessibility and UDL. There we go. Thanks. And Betsy asked a great question about will you know, will our center ever be reaching out beyond the the U.S. focus? And there's so much need for this around the world. And that's an excellent question, uh, Betsy. We would never turn away anybody who comes to our site. Um, or reaches out to us through email or telephone. Uh, as many of you, you know, we have three tiers of technical assistance at the AIM Center, Universal TA, of which this webinar is an example, the resources are on our website, uh, anything that's available 24 seven, regardless of somebody's time zone. And they can always, anybody can always reach out. We, it's not infrequent that we hear from people internationally wanting resources. Of course, we can't change the, the laws uh, that are most relevant to the United States. Um, but of course, best practices around accessibility, as you know, really applies uh, across the globe. So we are funded by the US Department of Education. So our charge really is uh, the United States, but absolutely we, um, you know, we really wanna hear internationally because we know that that will also help us uh, do better at having a, a broader context for what accessibility means, not just in the United States, but across cultures. So thank you for that question. Cynthia, and uh, Cassie mentioned this at the beginning, but I just wanted to highlight it a little bit more. If you place the cursor on the search um, area and then just tab through the site a couple of times, we just want to uh, show you how we have these enhanced keyboard focus state. So they're really easy to see as you're tabbing through the website. Uh, they really help those people that navigate with just the keyboard, either because they use assistive technology or they have a preference for using the keyboard. It really helps you track where you are on the page uh, with those enhanced focus dates, which are part of uh, the revised web content accessibility guidelines coming up, uh, WCAG 2.2. And it, this is Janet, and it might, as you're tabbing through, to just point out, we also have um, the read aloud version built into the site, so you can have the site read to you um, by uh, pointing at that little arrow play button, and that's a really nice feature as well. Like Luis said, it might just be um, your preference, or you might need that for um, reasons of perception, so um, it's there for everyone to use, and it's a nice, easy-to-use feature.
Another resource that we have um, found to be useful that we point a lot of people to um, is this understanding the VPAT, the Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. And what's really important to, to note about this resource related to the VPAT, VPAT is the, uh, is the template that follows the Section 508 uh, guidelines and is typically commonly a requirement of vendors or developers or publishers. Uh, everybody should be asking for a VPAT as part of the procurement and selection process. Uh, the VPAT is, as we said, voluntary. So uh, typically is self-report by the vendor. Uh, so as a user, as a recipient of the VPAT, there are some really important considerations uh, to make. So while there are a lot of resources out there that are specific for vendors, so vendors need to know how to create a high quality uh, VPAT, which actually becomes um, an accessibility compliance report once it's, once it's completed, uh, there really wasn't much to support the users of that VPAT. So as a school district, as a state level, if you're at a university or workforce or early childhood, whatever it is you're purchasing should be able to ask the vendor for a voluntary product accessibility template. And then we have some guidance on our site for how do you interpret that? How do you uh, make sure that what, what the VPAT is, is saying, what it's reporting is accurate? It's uh, very difficult, very difficult to, to do that, as you can imagine, unless you are somebody who is in the position of understanding the standards. So what we like to say is the VPAT is really a starting point for communication with the vendor. So what, is, what are some of the key things that you should be looking for in the VPAT to have an understanding of whether or not the, the vendor is being upfront, is being accurate, is being thorough? And what types of questions can you ask based on the information that's, uh, that's being reported? And of course, over time, um, improving your understanding of the, of the VPAT and, and what to be looking for. So as part of this resource, uh, we have a faux process of uh, the online learning systems accessibility, and it really simulates, if you were to receive a VPAT, what would be some of the things that you should be looking for? So it walks you through the process of reading the, the what becomes the accessibility compliance report, and we provide some notes of what, to, what you should see there if it is a high quality, uh, accurate, thorough uh, VPAT. So something that people often come to our website because as Janet mentioned under Get Started, you'll see that we provide technical assistance to, to vendors, to publishers and developers, as well as users of accessible materials. So sometimes seeing um, VPAT, people will assume that it's a resource for, for vendors when really it's a resource for, uh, for users of the VPAT. And I uh, put this in the chat earlier, but Rachel is um, one of the participants today. And it reminded me that to let you all know how many people helped the AIM Center work on this project. We had quality panel members, advisory board feedback, um, card sorting activities, and uh, Cassie and Cynthia can talk more to that, but it really, um, took a lot of people's input and eyeballs on this site to uh, and testing uh, of it. So it, it, it took a team and I just wanna acknowledge all the people behind the scenes who really helped uh, make it what it is. Yeah, thanks for that, Janet. We really can't understate how much we rely on our users uh, to give us both input and feedback. So even though you know, the, the new website has launched, uh, we are iterating all the time. In fact, I'm gonna pass it over to Cassie in a minute. She's going to forecast for you what's next. This is, you know, this is a dynamic website. Um, we really have a lot more work to do over time to enhance it. We think we have a really solid foundation and thank you so much for uh, your constructive uh, feedback that's already coming in through the chat. Uh, there will be a survey at the end of this webinar. We hope that everybody continues to uh, provide us feedback that way as well, because uh, this is a living, breathing website that is going to, to grow over time, both from anybody who comes to the site uh, looking for a particular resource to 
the states that we're working with, the districts that we're working with through intensive technical assistance. So this is something that's going to uh, iterate over time. And we can't thank uh, both the people who provided input on the design as well as the continuous feedback that we know everyone will be uh, providing because this is a service for you and we wanna make sure that it's, that it's relevant and useful. So Cassie, I'm gonna head on over to, back to the, um, uh, to the, to the slide deck. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk a little bit about what's next? Absolutely. And, and thank you for just bringing the, both you and Janet, the, the user experience process that we, we brought to the forefront during this. It was, it's, um, you know, a website really is, we used to say, it's like having a puppy. You have to care for it. You have to continue to care for it. You can't just stop at any point. And so all of the collaboration and the workflows that we've built up are really just the most beautiful outcome of working like this. It's user focused and the ongoing work of growing it and adding more connections um, will continue to be a collaborative effort. And so we've, you know, as we've said, we've streamlined, we've gotten a better baseline to work from. And as we grow that, we'll continue to prune and shape that together, bringing all of our expertise and very candid user feedback to the process. So thank you everybody. And I hope the survey, <laughs> I'm looking forward to the survey. Um, so one of the things that we'll be layering in as we go is we've maintained a, a kind of a common understanding of everything that's there. And we've started auditing the purposes and connections that users might come looking for. So uh, the quality indicators, for example, are a real core concept across all of this content. And we're looking for opportunities to connect content right back to them. So that if you're coming for a real, I need this now kind of moment, you're still able to follow that back up to a more systemic view and more systemic change kind of model. Um, so that's one example of just continuing to audit your content, continuing to be aware of your users' needs as they grow and change um, over time. That's kind of the, the mental model of, of governing the web content over time. Um, we're also looking to give more, um, more cues throughout the website for where connections, you know, we, we've got the content, we've got the language, we've got the concepts, starting to layer in more consistent visuals that can serve as more of a signage around the website for when, if we have a, a consistent kind of call out, we can add a kind of iconography to the site or a layer that helps people know what we're talking about and what the kind of calls to action around the website are related to so that as you're prioritizing your experience of going through content, you know where to dive next and what's most relevant to your, your current experience. Great. Thanks, Cassie. And I think as we, um, you know, some of the comments about you know, the absence of the, I guess, the, ex the explicit connection between AIM and Universal Design for Learning, we really appreciate that feedback. You know, that's something that we can, you know, we can incorporate more of. Um, uh, to provide that, I, we know that many of you are providing are, are providing training in professional development, doing a lot of work related to UDL, and it's not always clear how does accessibility fit into that. So we we appreciate that comment. Um, and if you have you know, if you have recommendations for specifically that connection between how you're how you're introducing people to UDL in your own you know, in your own setting and how you'd like us to support you in making sure that accessibility is embedded within the implementation of UDL. Uh, we have our own uh, perception of what that, you know, what that looks like, uh, but we'd really appreciate hearing from you as we move forward with, uh, with developing our resources. Okay, so um, we will stay on here and continue to look in the, in the chat for some, for some comments. The webinar evaluation that we have is a little bit different. So if you are name center webinar high flyer, and we know many of you are, today's survey is going to look a little bit different. Our external evaluator Evergreen is doing, uh, doing an external evaluation for us. So this is a formative evaluation. Uh, we really appreciate you taking some time. Uh, this is sort of a little goes beyond how we use our uh, webinar feedback continuously to make sure that we are always improving. This evaluation also informs our project progress um, as well as some, some reporting requirements. So 
This survey is going to look a little bit differently. You may re also receive a reminder from Evergreen next week, uh, looking for you know, increasing their sample size to make sure that uh, they're capturing really the quality relevance and utility um, of our services and particularly using this webinar as an example. So I believe that the link is also uh, in the chat and you'll also be taken directly to the web to the webinar evaluation when you exit out of um, out of today's uh, webinar when you exit out of zoom please stay connected with us uh, you can always reach us by email a uh, number of us are on the aem at cast.org list so when a request comes in typically we identify uh, the right person to get back in touch with you within 24 hours you can always follow us on twitter through cast at cast underscore udl and of course on facebook at cast udl so i'm going to pass it back to my trusted co-host who walked us through the, through the through the website um, to really send everybody off with some final thoughts thanks again who wants to take the leap <laughs> Well, I would just say that, um, you know, there's lots of great content on the website for you. And we're also trying to model accessibility throughout the website. So it's um, another important consideration that went into the website. So we welcome feedback on both fronts, uh, how we can make the experience even better because it's an iteration process. So thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon and I'll pass it along to the other uh, panelists and see if they have other thoughts as we see you out out the door of the open house <laughs> uh, this is janet grab some cookies on your way out right <laughs> isn't that what you get at open houses um i would just encourage everyone to set aside even more time to dive into the resources there is a lot of information on the page um, and i think that um, it's worth your time to get familiar with what's out there so and with that all say goodbye to. And as you're, um, as you're starting to explore the website further, because this hour is not near enough for what's all out there. Um, but as you're thinking about um, familiarizing yourself, also consider familiarizing other key stakeholders and people that you partner with regularly. Um, this open house uh, hopefully offered you a perspective that we did very intentionally keep the end user in mind. And there are a lot of end users in this work. So um, send people to the website, get their feedback, get their thoughts and, and um, continue this, this great work. Hey everybody, this is, Cassie, this is Leslie O'Callaghan, the Operations Leslie. Coordinator for the AIM Center. I'm so sorry to throw this quick logistical thing in, but we've got some questions about saving the chat. We do allow the chat to be saved here in all of our webinars. Thank you, Maggie, popped it into the uh, window. I just want to make sure that you all get this information. If you look below at the chat, uh, right to the right of the All Panelists and Attendees drop-down menu, you'll see a box with three little dots. If you press on that box, there will be an option to save the chat. We do allow all of our chats to be saved here at the AIM Center. So that you guys can read through it at a later date. Thank you. And sorry, Cassie, <laughs> I didn't mean to talk over you. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's very helpful. Lots of people asked. <laughs> I just wanted to underscore once again, if you're if you're in a position where you're sharing or creating content, um, just how, how important collaboration was to this process, really seeking feedback, seeking feedback, even when you're feeling like you're trying something out and you just don't know, and it's a plus one. Um, really being um, vulnerable with each other, people who have uh, different areas of expertise, you know, use things in different ways, being able to surface that, being able to share questions with each other, and then, you know, keep going, keep, keep iterating and, um, and learning more as you go. I think that was a really big part of how we worked together on this. And I just wanted to thank the team for, for embracing the uh, discomfort of really auditing and going through all of the content and coming to this new plateau <laughs> together. You know, we had fearless designers and fearless communication, uh, fearless project management. Uh, we are the, the content experts and it was just an amazing process um, that uh, the leadership in design communications and, and management walked us through at CAST and, we'll, and continue to do so. So thank you so much. And I know that apparently the, um, the uh, 
attendees can't see the the, the ellipsis uh, to download the chat. So as Leslie mentioned, uh, the chat will be distributed through uh, through the email list for attendees. So just be on the lookout for that. We're glad um, that the the chat will has useful resources. And please keep coming back. Please keep coming back. Uh, use that AEM at cast.org uh, email address. Give us feedback uh, through social media. Um, come of, you know, call us, you send us an email. Sometimes you'll see a phone number there. So we welcome um, you know, those conversations as well, particularly hearing what's going to be important to you uh, going forward. Thanks everybody.